Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, Leviticus uh, chapter 25, verse 47. And in our last lecture, we covered the uh, laws of the sabbatical years that the Israelites were to allow the land to rest every seventh year. And then every seven sets of seven years, every 49 years, the year following that would be the year of Jubilee. You know, it was uh, the failure of Israel to observe the sabbatical year and letting the land rest uh, was partially the reason for uh, Judah going into captivity to the Babylonians. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 21 Uh, the length of time that Judah spent in captivity to the Babylonians uh, was based on the fact that they had been failing to uh, observe the sabbatical year, 70 years, the time that God said they would be in captivity. And then as we ended our last lecture, we covered uh, the statutes or laws concerning an Israelite selling themselves into bondage to another Israelite. We're going to pick it up today, uh, verse 47 through 55 of this chapter uh, 25, having to do with an Israelite selling themselves into bondage to a foreigner Uh, In other words, a non-Israelite. So, got a lot of ground to cover today. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 47, and it reads, And if a sojourner, this simply means a foreigner, or stranger, wax rich by thee, becomes rich, And thy brother, an Israelite, in other words, that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family. Now, this is a little bit misleading. An Israelite could not sell themselves totally to be a slave. What we're talking about is they put themselves in bondage for a specified period of time and they were basically to be treated and paid as a day laborer. Uh, This word stock here, check it out in your Strong's Concordance, it means a naturalized citizen. So we're talking about someone who is not Israelite, but is a resident uh, within the boundaries of Israel. Can also be translated a transplanted person, verse 28. After that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Uh, Israelites could always be redeemed. It was just a matter of paying uh, what was owed to the person who paid the bond money to begin with. Uh, In other words, it was set up to be fair, but it was set up to where an Israelite, if he could, uh, a brother, Uh, A relative, this word uh, redeem is a legal term. It's gaal and gaal in the Hebrew tongue, and it means a kinsman redeemer. At any time during the bondage, if the the, uh, redemption money were paid, the person went free. Verse 49, either his uncle, the uncle of the person who sold themselves, or his uncle's son, his cousin in other words, may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he be able, he may redeem himself. At some point, if his, uh, you know, something happened that his financial situation changed and he was able to pay the ransom himself, the redemption money himself, that was uh, allowed as well. 
verse 50, and he shall reckon with him that bought him from the year that he was sold to him until the year of Jubilee. And the price of his sale shall be according unto the number of years, according to the time and hired servant uh, shall be it be with him. In other words, you calculate uh, the number of years remaining uh, until Jubilee when the person would have been made free regardless of redemption money being paid. Uh, for example, if we said that the selling price uh, were $30,000 for uh, easy figuring and there were uh, 10 years uh, left on, well, let's say he, the, the time was 10 years for the 30000 till till the next Jubilee. That would be $3,000 a year. So if the person worked five years and then could come up with, in other words, it would be five years till Jubilee times 3000 a year. If the person or a relative could come up with $15,000, uh, to, to pay the person who bought him to begin with, then he would go free. Uh, it's basically the same setup as the land that we covered in our last lecture. You couldn't sell your land, but you could lease the land. And uh, if it were to be uh, purchased out of, uh, out of uh, redemption money, then it was based on the number of years until the next Jubilee, verse 51. If there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for, whether uh, many years or few years, the price was determined by the number of years that were on the agreement, and then again, how many years it was until the next Jubilee, verse 52. And if there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall count with him, and according unto his years shall he give him again the price of his redemption. And again, this just as the land, which could not be purchased, but you could purchase the produce off of the land <clears throat> that was covered in, in previous lecture again. Verse 53. As a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in thy sight. Now this, as a yearly hired servant, in other words, as a, a day laborer who had been hired for uh, a term of years. And with rigor uh, means that they're not to be treated, a bond person was not to be treated uh, severely or oppressively. And in thy sight, this is addressed to the whole nation of Israel. And God's saying you won't tolerate uh, bond people for, for, for mistreating uh, those that are sold in bondage to them. It just, it's not to be tolerated. Verse 54, and if he be not redeemed in these years or or by these means that have just been previously discussed, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. He'd be set free at the year of Jubilee. It's easy for us to see why it was such a joyous time among the people of Israel. Uh, a year of liberty is what it was called uh, by many. And uh, things set right uh, according to the way God established them. I look forward to the day when Jesus returns to earth and sets things right once again. And uh, the earth will be rejuvenated at the end of the millennium when God's throne comes to earth. That's when things are really going to be set back the way God created them. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, the first few verses will document that. Verse 55, for unto me the children of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And they're my servants and therefore I can say to you, don't treat my servants uh, with severity or oppression. Um, and with that, we end the uh, law. Now, we're getting very close to the end 
of the law being given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, God's preparing the people of Israel to move in to the promised land. Now, in chapter 26, uh, we're going to have the blessings and the curses of God. Uh, some people have a difficult time saying th that God will curse his children. Well, if you call the opposite of blessings, whatever you want to call it, but it, it is cursing. And God's saying here in chapter 26, and by the way, this is a parallel chapter to Deuteronomy chapter 28, but God's saying, if you want my blessings, do the law that I just gave to, to Moses on Mount Sinai. If you don't want my blessings, don't do the law. The choice is yours. Let's go with chapter 26, verse 1. Ye shall make you no idols, nor graven image. Graven image is pesel in the Hebrew. It's a, a wood or stone carving. Neither rear you up standing image, matzabah in the Hebrew, a, a pillar such as a sun pillar. Neither shall you set up any image, this is makith in the Hebrew, it means a sculpted or painted stone in your land to bow down unto. And there you go, that's the key. Don't worship uh, rocks and sticks. For I am the Lord your God. And this applies even if you are sold into bondage to a foreigner. Uh, you don't practice idolatry. Why? Exodus 34, 14. God's name is jealous. And when you go worshiping other gods, small g, or worse than that, a, a rock or a stick, it hurts his feelings. He has feelings just like we do. When, well, you don't understand, Pastor Murray. We, we, we wouldn't worship idols. Well, we have today what I like to call uh, modern day idols, idols of this generation. And an idol doesn't have to be a rock or a stick. An idol can be anything that comes between you and your relationship with your heavenly father. If you're having to work two jobs to keep your mortgage paid and it doesn't give you enough time to worship your heavenly father, you've got an idol. Uh, it could be a, a motorcycle or a boat, uh, anything that comes between you and your relationship with your heavenly Father. Verse 2, Ye shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. The sacred name uh, adds emphasis and solemnity. Now, there are conditions to God's promises. If you don't meet the conditions, you can't claim the promises. Verse 3, if, and here's a condition, ye walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. James chapter 1, verse 22, we learn that you can't just be a hearer of God's word. You know, if you just hear the word and you don't do it, it does you no good whatsoever. You've got to walk the walk. Uh, you can't just talk the talk. Uh, you have to be a hearer and a doer of the word. <clears throat> this word uh, walk is interesting in the Hebrew. It's yalak. It means to grow. And you know it compares with another Hebrew word halak which can be translated to be conversant. So what this verse is saying is if you will grow in the Word of God and, and study the Word so that you can become conversant in the Word uh, then and be a doer of the Word, not just a hearer, then you can claim the following promise, verse 4. Then I will give you rain in due season. In Deuteronomy 11, we learn of the former rain and the latter rain, the former rain, which uh, causes the seed in agriculture to germinate. The latter rain then brings the plant to maturity where it can produce fruit. 
Uh, you can think of it both physically and spiritually. And the land shall yield her increase, her produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. You know, if you will uh, grow in God's word, if you will uh, learn to uh, be conversant in his word and be a doer of his word, not just a hearer of his word, God will see to it that you want for nothing. And again, this doesn't just apply physically. We're, you can apply this very much so spiritually. Uh, God uh, provides the seed. We plant the seed, but then it, cause, it takes that uh, former rain to cause a seed to germinate for a person to see the truth, in other words. And then the latter rain, uh, when the person learns to study on their own and, and becomes conversant in the Word of God, and then they're able to produce fruit on their own. They produce fruit for God. Verse 5, and you're threshing, this is daish in the Hebrew, uh, threshing time or season, shall reach unto the vintage. The vintage is the time that the grape crop comes in, which is in the fall. What this is saying is that if you will do things God's way, then your threshing, which begins in the spring, will last throughout the summer unto the fall. And the vintage, the fall, shall reach unto the sowing time, that's in spring. And you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely. You'll have uh, plenty to eat uh, throughout the year. Uh, spiritually, what is the bread? Bread of life is Jesus Christ. Verse 6, And I will give peace, uh, this could also be translated prosperity, in the land, and you shall lie down as uh, livestock where it has plenty to eat. Uh, they don't have to wander around all day looking for enough to eat. Uh, you'll see them in a plenteous pasture uh, around noon laying down, and that's what this is, uh, resting like the flock of sheep lie down when they've had sufficient to eat. And none shall make you afraid, and I will rid evil beasts, these are beasts of prey, out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. This word sword is kereb in the Hebrew. It means a drought or a sword. But you do things God's way. Uh, you grow in his word. Uh, you learn to be conversant in his word and you do his word. Then you can claim these promises from your heavenly Father. And you shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And symbolically, the sword is truth. Uh, the tongue of Jesus Christ in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 1, verse 16, that two-edged sword that cuts both ways. <clears throat> verse 8, And five of you shall chase an hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. When God is on your side, or better said, when you are fighting in God's army, you have the victory. You, you are going to win. And think about that. Five putting a hundred of the enemy to flight, and hundred uh, putting ten thousand of the enemy to flight. Certainly the opposite of Isaiah chapter 30 verse 17 when Zedekiah uh, ran to the Egyptians for help when the Assyrians came uh, knocking on their door. They didn't depend on God for his help. Uh, they went running to the Egyptians. Didn't do them any good. Verse 9. For I will, have, I will have respect, or I'll turn unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. This word establish in the Hebrew is kum. It means to make good, uh, to keep, and God always keeps his promises. 
He always keeps his covenants. It's, it's man who breaks uh, promises and breaks covenants. You can think of a covenant as a contract. Verse 10, And you shall eat old store and bring forth the old because of the new. Now, this is in an agriculture sense. This is saying that you'll fill your barns up, but next year when it's time to bring in the new crop, you'll still have old crops left in the barn that you're going to have to uh, eat up before you can fill your barn up again. In other words, nobody's going hungry. Look, look at the USA and Canada today. We produce grains uh, sufficient to export by the tons. And uh, there's actually, and don't misunderstand what I'm saying, I know there are people who go hungry in the United States, but there is no need for people to go hungry in the United States. We're blessed uh, with uh, a lot to eat. And this can be taken on a spiritual level too. Uh, what is the opposite of plenty to eat? Well, it's not enough to eat. And spiritually, uh, not enough to eat, Amos chapter 8, uh, verse 11. Uh, the famine of the end times is not for food, or drink, but for hearing the word of God. Verse 11, And I will set my tabernacle, this is God speaking, I will dwell among you, is what he's saying, and my soul, God himself, shall not abhor you. This means to uh, detest or reject. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Uh, in other words, after you, you come into the promised land, God's saying, if you'll do these things, uh, grow in my word, uh, and learn to become conversant in my word, and do my word, not just hear my word, I'll walk among you. you know, I'm not going to be behind the veil on the Ark of the Covenant. We're, we're going to grow ever closer and closer uh, in our relationship and fellowship together. Uh, if man had kept up there into the bargain, that would have happened. Uh, unfortunately, man did not, as usual, keep up there into the bargain. Verse 13, I am the Lord your God, which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their bondmen. And I have broken the bands, or poles, of your yoke, and made you go upright. And here, uh, God compares those who are in bondage to uh, an, an animal that's, that's bowed down and over under a yoke, working for someone else. And God's saying, I, I broke the poles of your yoke. Now, we've been talking about how good things can be if you grow in the Word, if you become conversant in the Word, if you'll do the Word, now we're going to hear what happens if you don't do those things. Verse 14, But if you will not hearken unto me, and will not do all these commandments, and this word hearken in the Hebrew is shama, it means to hear intelligently, which means to hear with understanding. It does you no good if you hear something, but you don't understand it. And what we're talking about will not do all these commandments. We're not talking about one single sin. We're talking about overall contempt for the Word of God. In other words, these those who reject God and His Word. Verse 15. And if you shall despise my statutes, Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, the priest despised Father's very name. Or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. And again, this means to violate his covenant, to break the contract, the agreement. If you don't meet the conditions, you can't expect the positive promises. You're about to learn the negative, the cursings 
of what happens if you don't do things God's way. But again, I don't want anyone getting on a guilt trip. We're not talking about a single sin. We're talking about overall contempt for the Word. And we're going to see four phases of rebellion against God. For phase one is verse 16 and the following verses. I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning og, that's a burning fever, that shall consume the eyes. The eyes are the light of this life and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And this contrast uh, with the preservation uh, from illness and sickness that God promised in Exodus chapter 15, uh, verse 26, where he actually says, I will heal you if you will do things my way. Exodus 23, 25, also promises that God will deliver uh, you from illness if you uh, obey the law. This, you will you'll sow your seed in vain for your enemies shall eat it. That came to pass very much so. Uh, Judges chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. Uh, we're introduced to Med excuse me, we're introduced to Gideon who what was he doing when we are first meet Gideon? He was in a wine press trying to beat enough uh, wheat or barley from a little bit that he'd got to make some bread so his, his family would have something to eat. Why, you, don't, you don't thresh in a, in, a, in a wine press. Why was he down there? Because the Midianites, who Israel had thumped their gourds some 200 years earlier, were robbing and stealing the people of Israel blind. They would plant crops, but the Midianites would come and steal uh, the produce. Verse 17, And I will set my face against you, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you. In other words, those who defeat you are going to reign over you. And ye shall flee when none pursueth you. In verse 36, we learn that the sound of a rustling leaf will cause you to run when no one pursues you. Paranoia, quite a comparison to verse 8, where we learn that if you do things God's way, five of you can put a hundred of the enemy to flight, a hundred of you can put 10,000 of the enemy to flight if you do things God's way. Don't do things his way and run at the sound of a rustling leaf. And if you will not yet for all this hearken unto me, then I will punish or chastise you seven times more for your sins. And again, we're talking about habitual sinfulness. Verse 19, And I will break the pride of your power. This word pride in the Hebrew is gaon. It means the arrogance. I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. And that's in comparison to the latter and the former rain that God will provide if you do things His way. How much water are you going to get out of a heaven that's made out of iron? Zero. There's going to be no rain. I'll make your earth as brass. You can't plant seeds much less germinate seeds and, and harvest crops from ground that's as hard as brass. Verse 20, And your strength shall be spent in vain. This means emptiness. For your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. Now we come to step two or phase two. Uh, if you uh, not only do what this is stated in these verses, uh, here's what you got coming. Phase two. And if ye walk contrary unto me, even further apostasy, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. 22. And I will also send wild beasts among you, 
which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number. I'm going to cause your women to be barren and your female livestock to be barren. And your highways shall be desolate, no bustling commerce, no booming economy. Uh, things are going to be like a wilderness is what desolate means. Now we go to phase three of the apostasy. And if you will not be reformed by me by these things, but will walk contrary unto me, then will I also walk contrary unto you and will punish you yet seven times for your sins. That's a lot of seven times seven. Uh, you want that much of God's wrath? And you know what, at any time if they changed and realized the error of their way and repented, you would go back to uh, the beginning, phase one, verse 25. And I, the Lord speaking, will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel or the breach of my covenant. And when you are gathered together within your cities, in your fortified walled cities, I will send the pestilence among you. And ye, those survivors who don't die of the plague, shall be delivered under the hand of the enemy. Covenant forfeited. Uh, that brings vengeance from the Lord for your breaking his covenant. Uh, no more blessings. Verse 26, And when I have broken the staff, or the support of, your, of life, of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. Normally, there would be one oven per each woman. This is saying you only need one oven for ten women. Why? There's no, nothing to make bread with. And they shall deliver you your bread again by weight in rations, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. Uh, spiritually speaking, how are you being fed? Uh, are you being fed well from God's word, or are you starving to death? Verse 27, this is the fourth phase. And if you will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary to me, four stages, here comes the severest of punishments. Then I will walk contrary unto you also in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. That's a lot of seven times seven times seven. Jeremiah chapter 21 verse 5, uh, Zedekiah went running uh, to Jeremiah concerning the king of Babylon. Jeremiah told Zedekiah, Yahweh himself will fight against Israel in anger, in fury, and great wrath. That's one group you don't want to be in, having God fighting against you in anger, fury, and great wrath. 29, And ye shall eat the flesh of your sons, and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. This also came to pass. Jehoram the, was the king of Israel. And, and you can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Uh, Benadad had laid siege to Samaria, the capital of the northern tribes, Israel. And it got so bad that two women had agreed that they would eat one of them's son one day and the other one's son the next day. And the woman came to the king, Jehoram, and was complaining that the agreement had been made. But then the second day came, and the woman hid her son so they couldn't eat him. Uh, Jehoram rent his clothes at the terror of this. But uh, th th that's the way it is, you know. This only makes sense, too. A lot of people go, well, boy, that's awful mean of God. No, he tells you if, if you do things this way, you get blessings. If you do things this way, you receive cursings. Anyone with any intelligence at all should be able to figure out that's fair and you get what you deserve. The ones who don't have very much intelligence are the ones who get to phase four and don't realize the error of their way and look up to heaven and say, Father, please forgive me because we're going to learn in our next lecture. That's all you have to do 
is say, Father, please forgive me, and the curses are gone. You're back in good stead with your Father. But you've got to repent, and you have to mean it from your heart. We'll come back and finish this book of Leviticus in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back to the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. Excuse me, if you have a biblical question that you'd like to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we try and teach God's Word in a positive format. Throwing out negative about others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, serves no purpose. We won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the Internet somewhere around the world that's unable to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in uh, as well. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone. You don't need a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to go to Him at least once a day. Make time to talk to your Heavenly Father. You don't have to go through some fancy rigmarole of getting down on your knees and clasping your hands and closing your eyes. You can talk to him anywhere, anytime. And uh, you know what? He, he loves to hear from you. Uh, he is your father. He's the closest relative that you have, and you should be able to talk to him just like you do your flesh father. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these you know their needs, Father, uh, financial difficulties, marital problems, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. We also lift up our military troops and our law enforcement uh, officers who are in harm's way around the world. Father, watch over, guide, direct, protect, touch, heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up today, Mark from Oklahoma. Uh, what is the role difference between the evil spirits around us and the Kenites? Uh, why two influences we appreciate your business? Well, all make up uh, the locust army of Joel uh, chapter 1 and Revelation uh, chapter 9. They all work for Satan. Sandy in Missouri, uh, the Lord led me to you long ago. It wasn't by accident. He knew what I needed, what I was waiting for, what a blessing your teaching has been. Well, we're glad you enjoyed the, the Bible study. Will God be disappointed in me if I don't go to the other side to try to help my family to come to Jesus? I have told all my friends and family the way to be saved. Some listen and others think I am brainwashed. I just tell the unbelieving someday they will remember my words from God. I will do what the Lord would have me do. I love them all. I pray daily they will have an open heart. Uh, your opinion, please. This has become a real problem to me. 
I just don't want to be away from my Lord for any amount of time. Uh, help, please. Well, and of course, uh, what Sandy's talking about is that in the millennial temple, those who participate in the first resurrection will be allowed to leave the temple uh, for a period of time to try and help an immediate family member who didn't make the first resurrection. Um, nothing written in Ezekiel 44 concerning the elect having to leave the temple, but uh, Sandy, God's elect are normally a characteristic that's common among all of them is that they're compassionate people. I think most will want to go to their immediate family members who didn't make the cut to try and talk some sense into them. And you know, uh, uh, you know, if and I'll leave it at that. Let's go with Bill in Missouri. Uh, you answered a question about a gay person teaching the word that they were not to teach because homosexuality is an abomination to God. Bill, I don't know what you heard, but you, you've never heard me say that a gay person should not teach the word. Uh, you have heard me say that homosexuality is an abomination to God, but you're misquoting me when you say that I said that they can't teach the word of God. Nancy from Tennessee, if Satan knows about the elect, could he not decide to not call them up to testify. God's word states that his election will be delivered up before the synagogue of Satan. Uh, you can count on it. It is going to happen. The elect will be delivered up. How do I know that's so sure? For sure, because God's word says so. Tom in Alabama, God's sacred name, Yahweh Yuri. How did that name become if there are no J's in the Hebrew language? And Jiri translated into English is J-I-R-E-H. That is, though, a transliteration. It's not in the original Hebrew. Properly pronounced, the name you mentioned is uh, Yahweh Yuri with a Y. And it means the Lord will provide. Uh, it's utilized in Genesis uh, chapter 22, verse 14, when Abraham was instructed to take his son, uh, Isaac, his only son at the time, Isaac, uh, to Mount Moriah and offer him for sacrifice. Uh, Abraham was faithful and, and he was going through with it, but uh, God stopped him just as he was about to make the sacrifice and he provided a ram from a bush, thus the name Yahweh Yuri. You called it his sacred name. His sacred name is Y-H-V-H, -H, Yahweh Yuri. I think, what is it uh, in the Companion Bible, Appendix 4? I think that's right. It has the various names of God and it's, there are a lot more than one uh, that apply to our Heavenly Father. Uh, Betty in Wyoming, <clears throat> today you mentioned two dates, 1948 and 1967. I understood 1948, but what happened in 1967? Uh, the Six Day War uh, took place uh, between June 5th and 10th of 1967. Uh, Israel's decisive victory affected land in the areas of the Sinai Peninsula, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and even Jerusalem. So uh, that was the event that happened in 1967. Uh, I believe 90% that we're talking that 1948 was the year that the fig tree shoot was set out. That was the year that Israel became a nation once again. It's possibly though 1967. I, we throw that in because it's a possibility. Mary in Mississippi, I need a Bible verse to give my granddaughter. She thinks she likes girls, okay? Well, if she reads the Bible and believes the Bible is God's word, I would share Leviticus 
chapter 18, verse 22, uh, chapter 20, verse 13, states that homosexuality is an abomination to God. Uh, some folks say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, there's New Testament scripture as well. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 27, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Robert in Louisiana, why would it take a thousand years at the end of time when it only took Jesus three days when he was in the tomb? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, uh, don't want you to be ignorant of the fact that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. That's the reason that the millennium, the thousand years, is called the Lord's Day in so many places. Uh, will it be a thousand years our time and one day in the Lord's? Well, we'll find out. Carol in Florida. How close are we to the sixth trump? I know we are in the fifth trump. That's correct. Also, what trump do the two witnesses come? Now, the two witnesses come before the Antichrist, just before. So they'll come at the end of the fifth trump. Uh, the, what happens when the sixth trump sounds? Uh, the Antichrist is here. Again, the two witnesses, Revelation chapter 11, uh, tell us that the two witnesses uh, arrive a little bit before the Antichrist. Peggy from Alabama, I sat under your father's teaching for almost 20 years. Well, God bless you. Thank you for keeping him alive through videotapes. Without the two of you, I would be ignorant and totally deceived. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. We're glad you enjoy studying the Word of God. My question, is keeping cash at home a mistake? Uh, will it be useless in a, sh a short time from now? Please help me know what to do. Well, the, the one world system, you can be assured, will establish their own uh, monetary currency. Uh, you see telltale signs of that in the euro, which is a common uh, monetary uh, currency for a block of nations in Europe. Uh, and I'm not saying that is the one world system, don't misunderstand. It's a type though for sure. Uh, keeping money at home is probably a mistake, number one. If you keep everything at home and somebody breaks into your house and robs you, uh, you've lost everything. Um, I would keep some precious metals on hand is what we recommend because money is going to be useless anyway. You're not going to be exchange, able to exchange your U.S. dollars for the one world monetary currency. Why? Because to do that, you would have to worship the Antichrist. And unless you take that mark of the beast, you're not going to be able to buy and sell because you're not going to have their one world currency. That does not mean that you won't be able to trade. And if you have some precious metal, uh, I, I prefer silver. Uh, it's valuable, but it's not as valuable as gold. Um, my point is it would uh, be hard to uh, give someone enough gold to go get some groceries for my family, but silver, that's another story. And then you should also have some uh, non-perishable food on hand, and not only for the tribulation of Antichrist, but if you had a, if you're in a city and you had a trucker strike for two weeks, uh, how much food would be on the shelves in your local grocery store? Probably very, very little. So always good to be prepared. Brian in Pennsylvania. Greetings. Sorry. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about there. I have developed another question during my study. In Revelation chapter 18, Babylon the Great is fallen, uh, and the merchants mourn because no one is buying their goods, verse 11. The chapter goes on to reveal their merchandise and grief, verses 12 through 19. 
In verse 23, it states that the merchants were the great men of the earth. Would the use of the term great men connect the merchants of the modern day descendants of the Geber? No, that you're, you're misunderstanding. There, there are no modern day descendants of the Nephilim, which are called Geber in the Hebrew tongue. Uh, God destroyed the first batch of them with the flood of Noah's time. There was, however, a second influx of the fallen angels as early as Genesis chapter 12, where they're called Canaanites, but they were the ones that were responsible for the giants of David's time. Goliath, he was a big one. Uh, what was God's plan to destroy the Geber, the descendants of the fallen angels, the second influx? the sword of Israel. There are no modern day Geber. Great men simply means uh, they, they're well thought of and prosperous. George in Rhode Island, how should one observe the Sabbath? I've heard pastors, preachers, and priests tell parishioners to observe it, but not one has yet to tell the assembly or listeners or viewers how. Do we pray and read the Bible all day? Do we cook all that day? Do we bathe, shave, work in the garden? What do we do? Question. All right, well, uh, George, Sabbath means rest. And here at Shepherd's Chapel, we teach that chapter 4 of the book of Hebrews is very clear that Jesus Christ is our rest. And I, we don't put our rest in Jesus Christ one day each week. We put our rest in Jesus Christ seven days a week. And uh, he became our high Sabbath, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, where we learn that Christ became our Passover. Yogish in Georgia, may God bless you and all your staff. Thank you for remembering our staff. Those that believe in the rapture and they pass away before the actual appearance of the Antichrist, will they not have to prove themselves at the end of the Lord's day when Satan is re released a short season? Isn't it possible that during that season when Satan is released, those rapture believers who are good to go into the eternity may be tempted to follow him since they would have in the flesh when he was upon earth. Those who uh, pass away believing in Jesus Christ uh, appears in the, uh, they are good to go into the kingdom of God. That's what God said, I'm okay with that. Uh, Candale, I believe in Georgia. <clears throat> when my daughter was on life support and out I was out of town, I didn't have my vial of anointing oil with me, and I bought a much larger bottle and asked Father to bless it. There is way too much oil just to pour out. How may I use it and to not be disrespectful? Or must I pour out the large bottle? Uh, my daughter lived, by the way, praise the Father, and I say hallelujah. Uh, it sounds like mission accomplished uh, with the oil. Uh, it's not the oil, of course, it's the, the power is in with our Heavenly Father. There's nothing wrong with disposing uh, of anointing oil that has served its usefulness. Uh, oil does go bad after a period of time and there's nothing disrespectful about pouring it out. I like to pour it out uh, in, on the ground. Um, but I, I would not use uh, oil that you have asked Father to bless, anointing oil, in a common purpose, such as uh, cooking or something of that nature. That, I think, would be disrespectful. And that's my opinion. Don't ask me to document that. Uh, uh, it's not written. Irma from Minnesota, after listening to the CD about most asked questions about the thousand years that's called the millennium, is that the millennium could 
is it that the millennium could only be one day according to the scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Yes, and uh, that is why uh, the thousand years is referenced to uh, the Lord's day in so many places. Uh, was your father a modern day prophet? I believe he was. Uh, he would not have wanted anyone to, he did not claim to be a prophet. Uh, he would not anyone he would not want anyone to refer to him as a prophet. Urim and Thummim, what is that talking about? It was kept in a pouch. Are they considered an idol? What are their purposes? Well, Urim and Thummim were not idols. They were uh, a means for the people of Israel to inquire of the Lord when they had major decisions to make. Urim, by the way, if you translate it, means light. Thummim means perfection. And when Israel were, for example, they were considering going to war, uh, they would consult the high priest, would reach in the pouch and pull out and were, they were able to determine whether God's decision was yes, go to war, or no, don't go to war. Uh, how that is exactly is not certain. What is certain is that the high priest did inquire of the Lord using the Urim and Thummim. And I am out of time. I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know, when he looks down and he sees you studying the letter that he wrote to you, it makes his day. You make his day, he's going to make your day. Blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important though, and it's this, beloved, you stay in his word every day. Every day in Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.